session. Because after a very brief welcome, I'm going to introduce our speaker for this session, Hannah Jackson, who's got a really neat story to tell us. Uh, let me turn on my video as well. Hi there. So welcome again to day two. We've got a, a, a half day program that's still pretty full of content for you. So uh, this next hour will be about multilingualism in Sakai and a very neat experiential learning project at the University of Dayton that Hannah has led. Uh, we'll follow up with sessions about alternative assessment from Wilma Hodges and a deep dive into Sakai's group awareness from uh, Christina Schweibert. And then don't leave yet because at noon we will have trivia as uh, and in part of as part of our wrap up and we will also be awarding some prizes so uh, if you want to be in line for prizes definitely stick around for the end of the day so strong content today and we're going to get started strongly as well so let me uh, as people are joining this room welcome to those who are still joining let me introduce our speaker, Hannah. So Hannah Jackson is an instructional designer at the University of Dayton Center for Online Learning. So she does the things there that instructional designers do, working with faculty, creating online courses, supporting teaching with technology. Hannah reached out to Wilma and me in March about this very neat project in which she had uh, worked with faculty members to get their advanced French and language students to work on translations of aspects of the Sakai UI and interface that hadn't yet received translations. So she'll have a whole lot more to say about it, but it was getting this email about this project, I was entirely intrigued. And I thought that lots of you at SakaiCon would likely be intrigued and want to learn more. So here we are today. So um, Hannah's background includes Francophone studies. It includes multilingualism in the classroom. She's been a public school teacher before transitioning to her role as an instructional designer. So she's got a pretty neat back, uh, background to bring to all of this. So with that said, let me turn this session over to Hannah. I'm pretty interested to hear the full story about this project. Maybe there are things that I haven't heard, and I think you'll be interested to hear this as well. So Hannah, take us away. Thank you, Josh. That was a really kind lead up. Um, I'll go ahead and can everyone see my screen? Right. So, as Josh mentioned, oh, get a microphone on. Thanks, so. All right. As Josh mentioned, uh, this is a little bit a look into an experiential learning project that we did this past semester at the University of Dayton, something we plan to do again in the future. So this was just um, kind of the pilot run of a project that we did with our students. Um, and starting off with this quote by author Catherine Ambaya, um, this is the approach we like to take at UD, educating the whole student and really searching for learning experiences that are active, that are situated in something in the real world that involves students participating with community partners. And in this case, our community partner was Sakai. So um, Sakai ended up kind of receiving, will end up receiving the benefits of, of these students' outcomes, um, as well as our University of Dayton campus, um, our version of the LMS will be more complete because of these students. And the basis of this project was that our LMS is a door, is our, what we call our iteration of Sakai. The little picture in the corner is Isidore's pet lizard, Lizador. Um, we like to have fun with our, our little um, giving Isidore its own personality. But when our developers at UD are working on features or tools or improvements to Sakai, it means that new bits and pieces of language are being added into the LMS. And those pieces of language that we call language bundles are only supported in English, right? The developers are making it in English. It goes into the LMS, it's only supported in English. So if you were to switch your site, um, the site language setting, your user interface to French or Arabic or any other language, there would be pieces in there, little buttons or words, maybe instructions that are still in English. And this picture is an example of that switch to French, but you can see some of the areas like manage overview, date manager are still in English. Um, so we decided to partner with some of our French and Spanish language students. Those are the students at UD that have um, kind of the more advanced classes. They have more advanced programs. So students who have the competencies to be able to do this kind of technical translation, translations. Um, we reached out to some professors and decided to partner with this project. So the student, from the student perspective, 
their kind of timeline for this project throughout the course of spring semester was to start with an introduction to understand what the need was. So these students use Sakai every single day, um, but they are not computer science students, they're language students. Um, so we kind of introduced the need to them. I gave a little background, um, showed them how to identify the code and the tags in the text because they were working around some code. Um, and then they had four months to do a workshop process. And then we finished up with a reflection and analysis. Um, and then our developers will take those translations and put them back into Sakai. So if you want to take a look at the, the Google Sheet where students were working, this is a copy of the Spanish Google Sheet. Um, but one of our developers, Joe, he pulled all of the language bundles that were only supported in English. And then I took it and made it into a more student compatible Google Sheet, one for each class. So there was a French composition class and a Spanish composition class. And each class got a Google Sheet to share. Um, and that was where they collaborated. And on the sheet, I put the location of the English text in Isidore or in Sakai. And then I gave all the students access to a playground site as instructors. So I added each student to um, just a site that they could kick around in and look through and find the terms that they were translating in context to help them more deeply understand the meaning. Um, so each term had its location in Isidore or in Sakai, and then it also had a column for the target language translation. And French students actually added two additional columns. So they had three columns of translations for most terms that they translated because it really was a problem solving and workshopping process to get to the, the most succinct and most correct translation. Um, and then there was also a section on the Google Sheet for instructors to check that the, the term or phrase was translated correctly and that it's okay to go back to Sakai. Um, and students when they were working had really freedom to choose how they wanted to work. And that was done intentionally with this experiential learning. We want students to drive the process and drive the learning. So our instructors gave them a workshopping process. Um, it was one class period per month. Rather than doing 10 minutes at the top of five class periods, they did a 50 minute class period per month. And they did that four times. And that way they had a chance to really dive into the, the terms and problem solve and get into that flow state of working with one another. Um, in that longer period of time. Most students wanted to work in pairs of twos or threes, um, and then they would be discussing and coming back with the instructor as they were working. It was a very open process. Some students preferred to um, work individually and just kind of hunker down on a piece of text, um, but they really spent time trying to deeply understand the meaning. And that was difficult for these students because again, they're not computer science students and they don't know the back end of Sky. Uh, they know the student side. And so they were having to really deeply understand the meaning, and then ran into the problem that in most cases, going from English to Spanish or French, terms cannot be translated literally word for word. And so they were working on a really deep level with the syntax um, and the meaning of, of the language. This is just an example of what um, one of the translations looks like. So just an example for this French translation of there are currently papers waiting to be reviewed. That straight, um, that phrase papers waiting to be reviewed. Um, students in their first iteration of the translation um, did a little bit of a more literal translation saying that papers are waiting to be graded. Um, and then they went down again saying that there's homework waiting for revision. And then they changed the tense a little bit on that saying that there's homework waiting to be revised. And so, just from those, it took them three times to end up getting to a succinct translation. And you can see that the instructor highlighted either of these. So either of those were okay for me to choose to put back into our document to go back into Sakai. Um, but you can really see an example of the workshopping process here that students were going through, working on a really deep level with the language and the syntax. Um, some resources that students chose um, that they really found the most helpful were word reference. That's a great one. Um, Spanish Dict for the Spanish students and Lexi Logos. Um, Google Translate, they noted, was particularly unhelpful, but they did use it sometimes to check formatting or um, a little bit of the, the flow of their sentences. Um, and then when students were done, we did a, um, a review at the end. We did a reflection. And I showed them this slide. Um, this is not all of the Spanish and French speaking um, institutions that use Sakai. And there are also Spanish and French speaking students on our University of Dayton campus that use Sakai um, or Spanish and French classes that use Sakai in the Spanish and French setting. So 
it really touches our campus at UD, makes it more accessible, but it also touches places all around the world. Um, and students were really kind of pleased and excited to see that, and a little bit nervous as well, um, to see that their translations were going to be seen by native speakers um, and used to make, make the LMS more complete for those people who are using, using the LMS in something that's other than English, starting with Spanish and French. Um, and over the course of the term, again, this is just our first iteration of this project. Um, Spanish students completed 437 translations. So that's an individual um, cell in that Google Doc. Um, it could be a longer one. It could be a very short phrase, um, just like a button, or it might be a set of instructions. Um, French students completed 612 with a total of 1,049 total translations by the end of the term. And that was 46% of the total Spanish bundles um, that we had, and then 64% total French bundles over four months of work time. By the end, during our reflection, um, students told me it was a phenomenal feeling to be trusted with a real world task. Um, they were excited about the applications and the fact that students at UD, as well as students around the world, would be seeing this um, very soon. They really express it context and deeply understanding the meaning of the word in English before they even started translating was one of the most difficult parts of this project. Um, and finding the context inside of Isidore, inside of Sakai, really was important for their process. They were very happy to do it um, and improve the functionality. A lot of students expressed that it exposed them to technical vocabulary. They haven't been exposed to it all in their time in our language program. Um, and then again, like I mentioned before, it was really an opportunity to work through the syntax and the translation process, which is not um, a skill that is often practiced in our language programs. This is just um, a little bit of a reflection from two of the students who participated in the project. Really exciting. Translation, interpretation, all those kind of things are things that I will be having to do in my job. So I found it as, you know, an application before I would go out and be getting paid for it in the real world. So a bit of uh, experience here in a learning environment definitely um, made it better. There's some things that don't like directly translate. So I think that, and I hadn't really taken a class like specifically in translation before. So kind of having to flip the mindset of like, I'm not translating words, I'm translating an idea and like framing it so like someone who needs to follow directions would be able to follow those directions rather than just understand the words that are there. I think that once I was able to better understand how to do that um, and was able to explore like where the different buttons were and like what I would need to know to be able to use them effectively, that really helped me be able to be better at doing the translations. All right. Um, and then from the instructor side of things, we had two participating instructors um, in this, a Spanish instructor and a French instructor. Um, they expressed that they were really glad to have an experiential learning project that was completely accessible and free. So the only prep that went into this was um, figuring out how to fit it into the term, writing a little bit of syllabus language, which I helped with. Um, I reached out to the chair and we got everything ready to go a couple weeks before the term started um, and it was free. It was experiential learning with a language partner that didn't have to be um, meeting face to face. So it was a really great way for these students to participate in experiential learning um, as language students. And then they were able to watch their students work through those problem solving areas and, and really working with the syntax in a way that they don't often get to in class. Here's a little bit of a clip from our participating French instructor. It's very important to, to see for students that something that they're majoring in is actually for a purpose. They can use it for something in the real world. It can have an impact on other people besides you know, being a paper that they write for the professor, the professor grades it and nobody else ever will read it or nobody else will ever see it. So I think it's great for them to see, look what you could do with language, look what you could maybe do in the future in your job, what you could use language skills for, right? I think sometimes people that study languages, students that get into languages don't really know, and, and what can I do if I don't want to go abroad? Like, what else could I do? All right, so 
Um, I alluded to this a little bit before, but if you're looking to do something similar, you're very welcome to contact me. We can talk about it. My email's on the screen, hjackson1 at udayton.edu. Um, and the very first step was just contact faculty and chairs. Um, we made sure they were interested. We talked through the whole process. I did a little write-up. Um, and then the first step after that was to meet with the classes and explain what was going on. And from there, it's really in the student and instructor's hands. So I'm sure that the next time we do this project, it will look different um, than the first time because it really is up to the students how they want to go about the translation and how they want to go about achieving the goal. Um, some of the other important things were to, again, allow a space for students to explore within the LMS and provide someone who has knowledge about the technical terms that they can refer to and ask questions to. Um, so for those students, it was me. And then I had my team that I went to if, if I wasn't sure about what something was. Um, but having someone that they can access um, is, is really important because these weren't or these weren't computer science students, right? They're language students. Most of them study political science, international affairs, or languages. Um, there was one student who studies French and Spanish, both. So they were really, um, the, a lot of this was new to them and providing someone who could help was really important. Um, and then also giving long periods of work time, as I mentioned before, kind of a workshop style seemed to be really helpful. Um, but again, going back to this idea that the best learning happens when students are driving the process and the teacher takes a step back or the facilitator takes a step back. And it is the students who are able to figure out how they want to go about solving this problem and achieving the goal by then. Um, so where we're going from here, I am still working with the instructors to finish um, approving and making sure all the translations are the ones that we want going back into the OMS. And then I'm just going to put them back into that Excel spreadsheet that our developer Joe pulled for me and send it back to him. Um, and he's going to work on getting those bundles back into Sakai, and then it'll go back out to the global community as well as University of Dayton. Eventually, we'll repeat the project and try to complete all the translations that we have a need for. So really, this the fact that Sakai is open source and it is our LMS on our campus um, is the reason why we were able to do this. You know, experiential learning with with something like Sakai, it doesn't have to be just for a computer science student or an MIS student. There's opportunities to be creative with, with the students who are in communications or English or education prep or other areas of need um, to work on something like this because it is open-ended and we do have the opportunity um, to continue to improve exponentially on, on the product that we have and the, the product that the students use every single day. I know the students at University of Dayton feel a lot of ownership um, and feel that they're active participants in Isidore, um, our iteration of Sky. And so this was a really neat way to see students connect with the global community through their language, um, as well as through the students. A lot of these students were seniors. So the students that are going to come um, next at UD that will be using Isidore, um, they'll see the, the effects of this, of their work. So. That's all I have for you today. Um, we can have some time to see questions. Thanks, Hannah. That was terrific. Um, it's it's so neat to see how this project has come along. And I haven't I hadn't seen the student clips yet. I love the student clips. So thank you for those. Um, so there are two comments in the chat that are more uh, commenty than questiony. But let me let me share those. Uh, Dave Evelyn from Johnson University writes, this is so amazing. I'd love to be able to do this with Russian, but we do not have such a language track, but we do have students in Ukraine. So it sounds like it was inspiring, but not potentially actionable for Dave. Dave, do you want to follow up on that at all? All right. Dave, comment in the, in the chat if you'd like to follow up. Uh, Martin Ramsey writes, maybe a little insight into how the Google Sheet work ends up in Sakai, just to learn behind the scenes how it works. So I think we heard a little bit about that after he made this comment at the tail end of your presentation, that the, the translations go back into the Google Sheet, the sheet goes back to the developer you've been working with, and he uh, gets them into Sakai Code at Dayton and prepared for contribution to the larger community. I, I am kind of curious... Uh, what the time frame is that you think about, you know, for what that work is going to look like. I mean, so we we just released Sakai 23, so it probably wouldn't be something that would be seen for a little while. Um, but from the Dayton perspective, um, I'm, I'm curious 
whether you have a goal in mind for how quickly you want to contribute the translations back to, to Sakai Master. Yeah, to be honest, that's not something that we've decided yet. Um, just working, it's a combination of working within our bandwidth and also um, taking the time with the instructors who are not on contract right now to finish approving everything um, and then getting it sent back. And, and as far as from the de development side, I'm not exactly sure what that looks like. Um, but yeah, it, it, it will be forthcoming and um, we can kind of decide a goal moving out from here, but we've just, just finished up the student portion of it, so. That is a great, uh, that's a great response. And actually noting that the instructors are on 10 month contracts is something that I hadn't thought about. So that's, that is, uh, that builds some extra lag time into the process, you know, le even leaving aside the bandwidth of your team. Yeah, it very much is a living process working with, with students who are in terms that are short and limited class time and instructors on 10 month contracts, but it definitely is something that's feasible um, and very, you know, we'll be able to repeat it and, and hopefully complete the task in the next year or two. Sounds great. So there's a question from Chuck, but I have a question that I wanted to pose before that. Um, the slide in which you had the four iterations of, of the translation, that was pretty neat to see. I was kind of curious if you could share with us a little bit about the, the steps that went into each of those uh, you know, grander steps that you showed. And I'm curious about the time that it took to get from the beginning of that workshopping process to the end. Yeah, so that's why um, what the slide that you saw there kind of gives a little look into why this is a very laborious process. It, it's time intensive um, because translation is not so much working with words as it is working with meaning and utility. So we have this LMS that we want to be effective how can you most succinctly communicate the message that you're trying to communicate um, for the user? And so for these students who are still learning the language, that meant first trying to really deeply understand in English what the purpose of that message was in Sakai. And then from there, it's working with verb tenses and the actual formation of the sentences to figure out how to communicate the meaning in, the, in a way that's going to be the most succinct. So, um, how to take the least amount of words and also what's going to sound the most natural to a native speaker. So that's kind of the process that students were going through. And often it was, uh, you know, sifting through the definitions of words that sometimes can have a lot of different ways. You can have a lot of different ways to say one thing. Um, and so, yeah, it, it really is hugely helpful for students with learning more vocabulary and, and technical vocabulary as well, um, because they're going through that process themselves and, and trying to figure out what would be best in this environment. Could you estimate the amount of time it took to get from the, the, the beginning of that slide to the end? I mean, I think it'd be useful context for folks in the room to know that that probably wasn't 30 minutes or an hour's worth of work. Um, I think it probably depends on the students that are working the group that they're working in. Um, I think that translation probably took a couple, I mean, it's it's interesting because the way the students did it, they finished the first column first, right? There wasn't a second and third column until later on. So I think um, they may have done a, a version of a translation for what they thought was correct, what they thought was best, and then come back later and workshopped, you know? So it really depends um, on the length of the translation and the, you know, the students that are working. I mean, I imagine that one could have taken a full workshop time. All right, uh, so let's see. So here's Dr. Chuck's question. He's curious about the split of effort between the instructor of record and the facilitator of the engaged learning. So how much was on the uh, the instructor and how much was on you for, for each of these engagements? Yeah, that's a great question. So I did, um, Paul was actually, Paul sitting in the back row there was the one with the idea. <laughs> um, so he kind of brought me in. This is my second day of work at UD. Um, I'm, I'm new to UD and, and he brought me in on this meeting um, because of my language background. And we sat with these instructors and we just kind of gauged their interest. Um, and after they were interested, I wrote up a, um, just a form that had potential syllabus language, summarize the project, benefits to the University of Dayton, benefits to our community, and I sent that to our experiential learning project, our experiential learning director at the University of Dayton, as well as our um, language chair, and just asked for everyone's permission. They said, go ahead. 
Um, and then from there, it was on the instructors to decide when they were going to fit it in and also to decide how they were going to grade and put it in their syllabus. Um, besides that, it was the students doing the workshopping. There was There is work on the instructors to approve the um, translations and decide which ones are actually going to go into the LMS and show me that they've approved. They just have to check in the um, spreadsheet. Um, and then there was also um, the grading side. So we did a reflection, which was the grade, um, the students' discussion. And if students weren't able to make it, they had to do a written version responding to discussion questions in their target language. Um, so both instructors made the project mandatory and a component of their class. And so that grading piece was on them. Um, but yeah, that's a little bit into how the balance. But who in the classroom would pay to be back to the students that introduced them? what this work was going to be in it. You know, when there was questions about like, how does the spreadsheet work? Was that the instructor of record that figured all that? Or that, that that's my question. Okay, yeah. So, the so, but, yeah, so Chuck just asked um, who, when students were, in, when who introduced the project to students and when they were having questions about the spreadsheet and things like that, who did they ask? And that was me. So I went in, um, it was like 15 minutes in the first week of the term. Um, and I went in and gave a very brief presentation. And then I put my contact information in their playground site on Sakai. And I also put a, a column in the Google Sheets. I didn't go over this. I put column in the Google Sheets for questions for me. And then I would check weekly in response to the students' questions. So the instructors were really key to giving feedback and help with um, the language component as well as finding the location in, in Isidore, sometimes they would be pulling up their own and they would be really an active part of the workshopping process. But as far as questions about the technical side or the Google Sheets um, or anything like that, I also made help documentation before. So I made a couple pages of keyboard shortcuts, how to do like different um, accents and things like that with keyboard shortcuts, keyboard shortcuts for um, Google Sheets, how to restore a version if they accidentally deleted one another's work, um, things like that. I made clear documentation for that and then linked it in their playground site as well. So they had access to all of that. Thanks for your question. Thank you. That's, a, that's amazing. So it's uh, it's 1027 AM. We've got a few minutes left in this session, uh, three or so, although we started a few minutes late given the welcome so we can run a few minutes into the break. Um, so I'm curious if anyone else has questions that they want to pose in the chat, please do, or if folks have questions in the room that you'd like to pose. I'll just note from the chat for those in the room who may not see this, that Martin Ramsey uh, flags that the biggest takeaway for him was the need for context, this idea of translating ideas instead of words. Uh, and Chuck further notes that uh, at the University of Michigan School of Information, when there's experiential learning, it's mostly the, the labor is mostly placed on the instructor. And so this division of labor is interesting. And as I read that comment, I think this is kind of it's interesting because there's uh, there's an institutional currency for this. You know, there is a value to the institution and to the unit of which you, Hannah, are a part of making these improvements to to the LMS. And it could be that for other experiential learning projects, the institution doesn't benefit in the same kind of way, or maybe you just need to work harder to find the benefit for the institution so the, the effort splitting could take place. So that's my my thought about all this. Yeah, absolutely. And the piece, Martin's comment about context, we had an hour, maybe hour and a half long reflection session. And I'd say for an, maybe 90% of it, the students talked about context. That was the most difficult thing for them. Um, was finding the context and communicating meaning. Um, that was huge. Yeah. Are there other questions that folks would like to raise? Yeah, I have a question. So, I'm um, how many of the, you know, the existing translation thing would go like the now do the translation to not the same that has to be able to see on the just like what you said, you know, the so you're talking about what's existing right now yeah. in Sakai. So Adrian asked what um how much of the existing translations in Sakai were just done maybe on Google Translate or with 
a translation that wasn't um, totally accurate? And that's a great question. I would love to know that. Yeah, that's a really good question. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. It's a it's a massive would be a massive undertaking, but that's a great question. Yeah, absolutely. And then Allison asks, um, were native speakers involved to review the translations? Um, that's a great question. Our our instructors were, um, and so they were reviewing the translations. I also um I connected our Spanish students with a Spanish Google group. Um, I'm not sure if they ever actually reached out, but they were connected with them um, and able to kind of post and ask questions in the, the um, Spanish speaking Google group. Um, but yeah, definitely having native speaker involvement is important. You know, could you imagine a version of this where it's a little bit more co-curricular? I mean, I'm thinking about Dave Evelyn's uh, situation. He notes that we have a set of Ukrainian students who could benefit. Many speak English themselves, but they're taxed with their circumstances. So on the one hand, their time is less available. But I, I wonder about a version of this in which a more expert student speaker might provide some of the approval for uh, either for, for it might be a peer reviewing process, a peer approval process or something else where you might be able to do it even if there isn't a language track potentially. Yeah, I think there's certainly a few different ways to set it up for, you know, quality control and making sure that everything is um, is good and, and conveys what we want it to convey before we put it into Sakai. Absolutely. All right. It is uh, 32 minutes past the hour. We've moved a little bit into our 10 minute break uh, before the next session, which will take place at 1040 Eastern. So that'll be Wilma's session about grading outside the box, creative approaches to alternative assessments. So um, given that we don't have any other questions in the chat, I just want to say a big thanks to Hannah, because I was psyched to learn about this. I am really glad that you made it to SakaiCon in person. I'm really glad that this your email turned into a presentation. So maybe for those who don't know, there's a longer blog post that you wrote about this project. So that might provide some background reading. I don't know if that might be something you could uh, post into the chat uh, or maybe into the uh, the conversations area in the Tri Sakai site a little bit later on. Yeah, I can put that into the site. There's also a full video with the rest of those interviews in there if you want to listen to students and instructors. Sounds Thanks, great. Josh. All right. Thanks so much. So we're going to go into a break now. We've got seven minutes at 1040 Eastern. We'll move into grading outside the box. So that session, that Zoom room will be fired up shortly. So take a break, uh, grab a few, grab a cup of coffee or uh, put your feet up for a few minutes and we'll see you back here in just a few minutes. Thanks all.